Our speaker today, John Lowe, is a Chicago native who earned his bachelor's degree in political science from the University at Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and then he graduated from the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law in 1998. His career has taken him many places, including being an attorney at uh, Kegler Brown Hill and Ritter, uh, GE Aviation, and now he is the CEO of Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams, with an S on the end. He's an advisory board of the Watershed Distillery, advisory board member, uh, Homage, and he's on the boards of Eat Well Distribution, White Castle, the Columbus Chamber, and the Greater Columbus Sports Commission. He became friends with Jenny and her husband, Charlie Bauer, while he was a first-year labor and employment attorney at Kegler, Brown, Hill & Ritter. John helped the couple set up the company in exchange for a pint of salty caramel ice cream and a beer. He has three kids and lives in Upper Arlington, and today John's going to share with us some of the insights of what's going on with Jenny's ice cream this past year and what's, in char what's ahead for the future. So help me welcome John Lowe to Columbus Rotary. Uh, it's great to be here. It is great to be here because there were many nights this past summer where I did not, I could not see a path that would enable me to stand in front of a group at the end of the year and say we survived and we're back. Um, and I can now uh, make that bold pronouncement and it feels fantastic and I'll share a little bit of just how bad it got. Uh, first, my father is here and I think it's, it's appropriate to, to start with a story uh, that relates to him. Uh, first of all, he was always uh, the super engaged father. He coached every basketball and baseball team I was ever on. He helped with the homework and all those things. And if I've amounted to anything, it's because of his unconditional love and support. Um, but uh, there was one day this summer when there were only two people <laughs> featured above the fold on the front page of the Columbus Dispatch. And I can laugh about it, or, or maybe that's a little too strong. I can make a little bit of a light of it at the moment because we know now that no one was significantly injured and, um, and there were no deaths related to Jenny's ice creams and the things. But at the moment, we didn't know how bad uh, things could be. And so above the fold, uh, the Columbus Dispatch had a headline about Jenny's, and I was the only person quoted. And the only other... Uh, story above the fold was that Bruce Jenner was becoming a woman. And my dad said, I have to admit, when we were growing up and we were eating Wheaties together, I never envisioned a day where that could be the only thing above the fold in a, in a newspaper, right? I remember Bruce Jenner on the cover of Wheaties. All right, so uh, here's a little insight into just how bad it got. Uh, I'm going to give you a little background that's a little bit uh, inside baseball, but we were a company that was uh, booming. We were having tremendous success. We had just opened, this is sort of late 2014, we had opened in Charleston, South Carolina to great success. We had opened in LA, and at this LA shop, a little corner in Los Feliz, uh, we had just incredible lines, incredible support, and the shop was outperforming the pro formas we had for it to be a uh, break even. And we were feeling really good. But we knew we needed more money to help grow, to, to be able to open up more of those shops. And the private equity markets are what I think everyone has dis, uh, settled on the description that they're frothy, right? Prices are too high, uh, private equity firms are overpaying, and we needed some of that private equity fund to keep going. And we'd been flirting with a number along the way, very worried that we would pick the wrong partner and that we would screw up some of the secret sauce inside the company that makes it a special place to be. We got very close in late 2014 on a deal, and that was set to close in early March. And the closer we got, the more worried we got that we had picked the wrong partner. And we were, we were very far down the path, and it felt like it was too late to turn our backs and the morning of close, we walked away from the deal. And Jenny, frankly, gave me a hug like uh, I haven't received a hug in a good long time. She doesn't cry. She is a super strong, very uh, 
uh, powerful person, but uh, she had a little bit of a tear welling up in her eye, and she said, this is not right, this isn't what we built this company for, this isn't who we want to be, let's not do this. And we walked away. And we knew we were putting the company in some financial jeopardy, but we knew that there were a whole bunch of other firms out there that would be there for us. And so we immediately pulled down a million dollar line of credit and knew that that was enough to get us through 2015 and we would go find a new partner, uh, which was a perfectly good plan until Listeria hit. And so Listeria hits us when we are much more vulnerable than we otherwise would have been. And the way Listeria hit us, I was sitting in a packaging meeting with an outside uh, firm that was pitching us on their ideas for some new things. And I had sort of pumped them up to Jenny because I thought we needed some outside brains to help us think through a new packaging look and a new uh, effort. And they were uh, failing. They, it was a boring meeting. And Jenny has a way of letting me know this is a boring meeting. And I have a way, I think, unintentionally of letting other people in the room know this is a boring meeting. And we have a glass wall. The CFO walked by and saw me and stopped and opened the door. And I thought he was being a great human being and rescuing me from this meeting. <laughs> it turns out he was not. He said, I apologize for this interruption. I need John to step out. I need to talk to him. And that set off the string of events that uh, over the next 24 hours changed our life. Uh, we very quickly huddled up as a, what, what he was informing me was that the FDA had shown up at our production facility and they thought, but they weren't sure, that there could be listeria in a pint of ice cream sold in Lincoln, Nebraska at a Whole Foods and they wanted to talk. And the only thing we knew about Listeria at that moment was that it had taken down Blue Bell. Sorry, do I have that right? Blue, yeah, Blue Bell. I confuse Blue Bunny and Blue Bell all the time. Um, and uh, we had absolutely no clue how it could have gotten in our ice cream, and we had no idea uh, what the future would entail. <coughs> and over the course of 24 hours, we quickly got our heads around a couple of things. And I will tell you that um, you don't know what your leadership team is like until they're under excruciating pressure and you can't see around the corner, you don't know what's coming. But there was very fast unanimity that we have to go broad. We cannot just recall this single pint or the single lot of ice cream because we had no better reason to think that it was just that lot than it was every lot we'd ever made. We had no basis for sort of limiting it because we had no idea how it had gotten in the ice cream. And as soon as we got to that point, we thought, well, we can't have our shops open, right? We can't be a company that thinks that there's a 3% or a 30% chance that somebody could get injured. And so we quickly got to that night, we have to shut down our shops, we can't open them up the next morning, et cetera. And we had absolutely no idea what this meant for uh, the financial viability of the company. Um, we had a vague understanding that we had recall insurance. It turns out we did, but there was an exclusion for bacteria. Uh, right, uh, so uh, we didn't have recall insurance. And we had business shutdown insurance, but that was aimed primarily, primarily at like uh, bad weather that would close a store for a night and you might lose a couple thousand bucks. So um, as that info started uh, rolling in, we knew we were in really deep water. And that Saturday morning, I took my kids to, um, to soccer. And as I was dropping them off and trying to keep a hat over my head very uh, 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 down far so no one would recognize me, uh, I saw an old friend, Andy Sweary, who works at the finance fund. And I said, Andy, is there any chance you guys have access to some emergency capital? Because we're going to need a bunch. I don't know how much, but we're going to need a bunch. And he said, I have no idea, but uh, I'll huddle up the team and I'll see what we can do. And I'm here to tell you that the finance fund loaned us a million and a half dollars when I couldn't tell them how we would ever have revenue again or when. And that million and a half was a lifeline for us that enabled us to keep some people employed, start hiring consultants to figure out how to fix the problem, fix
figure out what the problem was and how to fix it that I would not get to stand here today if they hadn't within one week of our ask been able to wire us uh, monies or at least say the answer is yes and we'll work out the details very soon that is a um, that is a debt we will forever owe. And I'm happy to tell you today that it was a six month loan. We have paid it back. And the interest on that million and a half will never do justice for just how important uh, that was to us. Our financial backers locally also stepped up to the plate to keep us alive. And it enabled us to go find the right private equity firm to keep us, uh, keep us afloat. We switched the way we manufacture ice cream we worked with uh, great partners at Smith's in Orville. They have a world-class production facility that uh, has been providing to us our, our milk and cream, and they have an ice cream production facility. We were quickly able to get our head around, wait a minute, we'll keep doing the things that make us special, the burning of sugar to make salty caramel but we'll provide those bases and those sauces and the things that we think are the special sauce to make our, our ice cream. We'll provide those to this existing facility that can then uh, churn out the world's greatest ice cream for us. And that sort of getting our heads around that was a path forward was then enough to allow the private equity world to think uh, that they could back us without a risk that Listeria could appear again. Let me, let me pause for a moment and tell you two quick stories. One, we opened the doors uh, to great fanfare the first time. The mayor scoops for two hours at our uh, short north location. We are back. Things are, are awesome. Things are booming. And the Columbus Partnership and the Columbus Foundation sponsor the Young American Leaders Program where the city sends nine or 10 people to Harvard Business School to talk about public leadership and how to, to foster uh, cross-sector um, efforts to improve the world. Government working together with business, working together with nonprofits. And I'm in the middle of that. I'm very fortunate to be asked. I'm there. I'm loving it. I find every uh, possible way to mention that I'll be at Harvard next week, right? And it's fantastic, and the phone rings, and they have found Listeria on the floor of this production facility. We've just spent a very significant amount of money uh, re-engineering. And I will tell you that probably 30 to 50 percent of all, ice, of all food production facilities have Listeria around them in some form. And we could have uh, simply stopped production, cleaned the place, opened back up, and started making ice cream again. And nobody would have been any the wiser. And that is done at food production facilities on a, if not daily, at least weekly basis around the country. And there is a good argument. I share this so that you're aware. There is a good argument that we overreacted and that that overreaction cost us millions. I'm on the phone in an empty classroom at the Harvard Business School on my cell phone, and I start getting our DC FDA lawyer and our New York and LA based uh, food safety consultants and our investors and our leadership team all via this cell phone from an empty classroom, trying to figure out how is it possible that we have listeria on the floor discovered again and what do we do about it. Ultimately, we decided we don't know how it got there, and thus we can't continue. We're going to shut down this facility. We're going to clean and figure things out. And with that, we can't have the shops open. We need to go public with the fact that we found it again, et cetera, et cetera. And that series of decisions cost us millions because it was reported that there was a second listeria outbreak. And there wasn't. And in fact, uh, it isn't unusual to find listeria and to clean it. And as long as it's in sort of what's thought of as zone three or four, that is away from the actual ice cream production, that's somewhat normal. And over the next year or two, we will decide whether we acted appropriately, whether we overreacted, et cetera. But 
we haven't had time to sort of catch our breath, but as we're looking back on it now, we're sort of feeling like it was the right thing to do, but we don't know whether that was, um, uh, whether that was the right call, whether we'll feel that way down the road. All right, so here's one other little tidbit. How am I doing on time? Quarter till. Um, we have managed to keep secret, and I'm going to um, begin talking about the fact that um, after we walked away from that initial private equity deal, I went to take a nap in our office, and I told my assistant, look, I'm going into the breast pumping room. I've checked with the one woman who uses it. She's done for the day. I'm going to take a nap on the couch. And my assistant looked up at me with a look of terror. And it dawned on me that there was something wrong and that um, I don't take naps. I'm, I can burn the candle at both ends. That's one of my strengths. And why the heck am I taking a nap in the middle of the day? This is three weeks pre-recall. And we, uh, I decide then I got to get to a doctor. And I get to a doctor, Dr. Blosser, my next door neighbor, takes great care of me. And um, we begin a long series of tests um, that for a good long time, including the day uh, of the FDA call, we believed I had stage 3B lung cancer that had spread to my lymph nodes. And for a extended period, uh, we were prepping for what that would mean. And I was scheduled to have the biopsy at the James the day we began making ice cream again. I had met with every leadership team member fighting back tears, telling them I wasn't coming back. We had prepped a plan for me not coming back. I had gone and hugged my folks and told them about it. And the James was amazing. Dr. Old, Matt Old, a very close friend, rearranged his schedule and sat with my wife during the biopsy. And, um, and we were planning on me starting chemo the next day. The doctor performing the surgery, the biopsy, comes running in and yells, it's not cancer, it's not cancer. I'm happy to reveal that what I had was histoplasmosis which is a fungal infection in the lungs tied to bat guano, bat poop, uh, that I probably picked up when I was in Costa Rica in February, but may have picked up in the Ohio Valley. It's not entirely unheard of. It knocked me down harder than it mo knocks most people down because I have a strange lung history. I'd had part of my lung removed in high school. Um, so I share that so you know just how bad it was at Jenny Splendid Ice Creams this summer. Uh, in addition to complete financial meltdown, uh, I thought I was looking at a world where my three boys were going to grow up without a dad, and that was, that was uh, as scary as anything I faced into this summer. But I am happy to report that the shops are back. We just exceeded our Cyber Monday sales by 20% compared to last year. We are poised as a leadership team and as a team to start kicking butt again in 2016. I'm anxious for us to open uh, a new shop and get the mojo back. Jenny is an amazingly resilient human being. She is as creative and strong as any human being you'll ever know. Where she's special is her ability to create within the box. And often my job is to describe the box for her. We can now do this. We used to be able to do this. Forget it. I know you spent 13 years of your life learning to do this. Now we can do this. Now we work with partners. Now we prep uh, ingredients ourselves. And within that box, she has been amazing. And I'm excited about the future for the company in our new model. Um, and it's great to stand here in front of you and say, uh, we survived, we're back, and we couldn't have done it without the community support we felt. So thank you. Questions? <clears throat> yes, sir. How do you stop wisteria from reappearing in your manufacturing process? So it came back once. So here's the true deal on how it came back. We are now about 90% sure. When we reworked the production facility, we, um, we changed a lot. 
what we left in place were trench drains where the ice cream machines sit um, that had been sort of a focal point in our studies of, of where listeria had been. And we had done everything. I mean, we had brought in some truly phenomenal experts. What we didn't realize was that one uh, PVC pipe that dumps onto that trench drain is actually piped back to a water cooling tower that sits outside the facility. It is a horrible design. As soon as somebody stuck a swab way up the pipe and because they realized, like, I'm not sure exactly where that leads, unfathomable within the ice cream industry that it could lead outside, but it did. And uh, that water cooling is air cooled, so we co sorry, we cool the machines with this water pumping through it. It then goes outside and drips while air passes through it. That air has uh, dirt in it, and dirt has listeria in it. And so we then flush that occasionally by not going straight into the sewer for reasons I can't explain, but being pumped back into the trench drain in our, sh in our production facility. And we are very confident that that's how listeria came back into the facility the one time they had just uh, done it. So um, we have a very rigorous uh, environmental uh, testing program. Uh, we swab the facility once a week with 130 uh, different sites throughout it. Uh, we haven't found listeria since we cut off that uh, place roughly four months ago, maybe six. I don't know. I've lost track of time. Um, and, and you probably never totally cut out listeria, but you monitor for it and, and figure out where it is. So far, we think we've actually cut it out, but we'll keep monitoring as most world-class food facilities now do. <coughs> you mentioned Bluebell, and I, I, that they also had this listeria, but I don't think they had the same reaction that Jenny's did. Can you tell us the difference? <coughs> Well, Bluebell is, um, is a very large company, been uh, uh, owned by multiple generations. They had a number of uh, production facilities. My understanding is that they became aware of listeria in their environment um, and now, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, did not react the way uh, they would today. Um, and I think most sort of the biggest issue was that they were selling ice cream long after they were aware of the potential it getting into the product, it sounds like from the, our understanding. And they were selling at hospitals, so sort of directly serving those most at risk uh, for, uh, for suffering the most um, from eating listeria. And I believe <coughs> there are now uh, I don't know where it is in litigation, but, but I believe there's a fair case that a number of people died as a result, um, you know, uh, but for the grace of God, right? Uh, um, and I do think that they did not handle the initial understanding the way they would today. In the back. Um, you spoke of Jenny's in LA and Charleston. What are your long range plans to bring it to other parts of the country? We, I believe, I believe that Jenny is the single greatest ice cream maker in the world. I think she is an enormous creative talent. She brought a chef's focus on quality and an artist's creativity to what had been a commodity product, ice cream. I think there is no end to the places um, people should get to enjoy Jenny's ice cream. Um, at the moment, I'm focused on continuing to have success where we've started, Nashville, Atlanta, Chicago, LA. The Charleston shop is sort of a one-off because it is such a food tourist destination, right? The wealth of Ohio, New York, DC, go there for the great restaurants and we want to serve uh, all of you who go there. Um, but I think there's no reason to believe we can't have a Jenny's in New Orleans or Miami Beach or pick the location. Um, but time will tell uh, how they continue to perform. 
Um, uh, but I want us to be the greatest American ice cream company, and I think that opening scoop shops is a way to do that because it introduces so many people to Jenny's creativity and quality. And then hopefully they fall in love and buy the pint of ice cream at their local Whole, Food, Whole Foods. Sorry, I'm, yes, go ahead, sir. You talked about how common Listeria is in the food industry. Help us understand why it, how, how it doesn't cause more public problem. Um, it survives in uh, cold production facilities. Ice cream uh, is the primary. Um, and um, I think that, you know, what, what we think has happened is that most people, um, if hit with listeria, don't die. They have flu-like symptoms. It's sort of a, a prototypical, uh, um, you know, I ate something bad yesterday, I'm fine the next day. Uh, that's not true for infants, that's not true for uh, elderly, those otherwise compromised. Um, and so we don't know. We think that testing is much better today than it has been historically, um, and we don't know whether there are, um, uh, if there's a reason that there's an increase in it other than increased testing. There was a hand over here, Pastor Lisa. I was deeply moved by your story about your resilience and your leadership team. You say you find out when going stuff. And I was reminded of the rotary four-way test. And it, is it the truth? Is it fair? Is it beneficial? Does it promote goodwill? And I think if you look at that, I think your company used that test in spades, exemplary. My wish for you is great success, and I'd love your story to be a Harvard case study in the future. It's very, very kind. Thank you. I've been blessed with a gift of knowing when to walk off the stage. I think that's <laughs> All right. All right, go ahead. Sorry, sorry for uh, not letting you walk off that. Um, the lovers and the haters of Jenny's were front and center in social media. How did that shape your reaction to, I mean, how did you make choices in the face of social media, or did you ignore it completely? Uh, can't ignore it completely, but in the, in the very short time uh, we had to sort of figure our way through it. We had to keep our head down and work. And um, what shapes us is what, sh what shaped us before, which is I believe we're an open company. We've got to be transparent <coughs> with our fans. It's the world we live in, unrelated, you know, going back six years ago. Uh, Kelly Mooney locally wrote the open brand. I completely buy into uh, that notion. People support companies more so than ever, especially millennials. Um, they support companies they believe in, whose values they, they admire, et cetera, et cetera. And it is important for our company to be an open company. That doesn't get to stop when you're in crisis mode. And so we went you know, sort of very public with what we knew when we knew it in an effort to continue that. That arms the haters, uh, your words, um, uh, with info, and it gives people a basis for sort of speculation. And I think our team handled all of that w with great aplomb. Uh, I will tell you that one of the first things we decided, based probably on my great GE training that handled crisis communication and planning maybe better than anybody, uh, we pulled in some of our top employees that were now not going to have a job at the shops for the short term and we set up a crisis communication center in the office and staffed it and brought in the lawyers and the training very quickly. Go get the information from people, uh, you know, answer the phones, answer social media, et cetera. And I think they handled that really, really well. And frankly, sort of after saying, I want us to do this, I didn't have to think about it again. Uh, that team did it uh, amazingly well. You, you decide whether we keep going. We're adjourned via Rotarian all week long. <laughs>